This video is a decompression of the left brachial plexus with the decompression of the anterior and middle scalene muscles. So a supraclavicular approach to the brachial plexus for thoracic outlet syndrome. And you'll see that Andrew again has a time code so if there's specific parts of this that you want to look at you can just go to the specific time. This is a long version. We have a shorter version. But this is the long version. And you can see that the left upper extremity is exposed. The incision is made above the clavicle. I've marked the lower aspect of the ear, the sternocleidomastoid, and the sternal notch is marked there as well. You can see just between my fingers there is the notch so that I can be oriented with respect to the anatomy in this area. It's a little complicated sometimes to identify the anterior and the middle scalene muscles and note that w which one is which. Especially in these TOS patients the brachial plexus is often hidden between these two muscles and when you go in you don't see the plexus you just see this smooth muscle. Now the platysma is the first thing you open up and I put some epinephrine in here uh, to decrease uh, bleeding, epinephrine without lidocaine. And I will open up the platysma and then I immediately look for these supraclavicular nerves and there's several of them. I'll follow them back proximally so they come to the trunk of the tree or one base but as you're coming through at this level, just a finger breadth above the clavicle, you'll see all the dif different distal branches of the supraclavicular nerves and you want to protect these nerves. You're operating on a patient that's got a lot of pain, otherwise you wouldn't be doing this dissection for the most part and so you don't want it to injure these nerves. So this is the extended version of our our decompression and I'm going very slowly through here. I'm using microbipolar cautery. I'm taking my time. I'm looking, looking, looking for these small cutaneous nerves so I don't give this patient a cutaneous neuroma. And there's several of them. When I identify them, then I'll put two vessel loops around them. This allows me to pull and tug the nerves back and forth out of the surgical field so I can get the brachial plexus decompressed. And these nerves tolerate well this tugging back and forth. The patients will usually have an area of numbness in the distribution of these nerves, and I tell them that preoperatively often. The numbness always goes away over time. There's one branch of the supraclavicular nerve and it's coming at a right angle turn as it's coming up proximally. I'll need to dissect that free. So take your time coming through here and anticipate that there'll be several. You may have noticed at the positioning picture that the patient had a tourniquet on their arm and that's because after I'm finished this procedure on this specific patient I'm going to do a ulnar nerve transposition. This woman has bilateral thoracic outlet and bilateral cubital tunnel and I started with a cubital tunnel release on the right side she did well with that and so on the left I'm going to do both the cubital and the thoracic outlet. I may need to come back and do a right thoracic outlet as well. Now I'm going to follow these little nerves proximally and you can see that little right angle turn I was talking about. You can also see that I don't pick the nerves up with my uh, pickups there. I push them from side to side but don't actually squeeze them or pick them up. Sort of move them around from side to side and microbipolar cautery. And now I've loosened that little cutaneous nerve up. I can't really remember if I ever cut one of these. I don't think so. But if I did, 
which I'd rather not, but if I did, I would crush the nerve proximally to make a axonotomatic injury, cauterize the distal end, and then bury it deep. So here's the supraclavicular nerve bundle coming together. You can see all those three or four little distal branches coming up here to the trunk on the vein. And I can mobilize them nicely proximally so that I'll be able to pull them aside and get in to do the brachial plexus decompression. So this takes quite a bit of time uh, to do this, but I believe it's definitely a good idea. And I'm dissecting them off the vein. Sometimes we have to divide that vein, and other times we don't. And I'd rather not if I didn't have to. I'd rather take the time just moving it back and forth. Now it looks like I'm pinching those nerves, but I'm not really. It's just a little gentle holding them more than anything. And you can see them coming together there as one nice little group. And I'm going to free them up so that they can move from side to side. And shortly I'll be asking for a couple of vessel loops. So here's the thing about these nerves, and pretty much most nerves, is that they will tolerate tugging back and forth. That may give you a neuropraxia. If you were to take your pickups and actually squeeze the nerves, you might get an axonotomatic injury. But you'd be highly unlikely to get a fourth degree injury. So the nerves can tolerate this tugging back and forth. And they certainly can tolerate that better than a cut. So you have to mobilize these nerves. You can see the blue background underneath. And that is because during this case, we took some still photographs. So that's why that blue background is there. Now, the next step is to identify the omohyoid. And I just divide the omohyoid. I don't reconstruct it after I am finished this procedure. And I divide it with microbipolar cautery and my Uh, Stevens tenotomies. And I'm mobilizing that vein to determine whether I need to take it or not. On the left side, you're aware of the lymphatics, of course. They're quite medially located. And here's that omohyoid now coming up. I like to divide it more in the tendinous portion because there's less bleeding in that area. But I will use the micro bipolar cautery and the tenotomies to do that. And here I am freeing up that omohyoid and then just divide it. And let that retract. And don't bother repairing it. Goodbye omohyoid. Now the next maneuver is to find the brachial plexus. And I do this by orienting myself by using my fingers to palpate the uh, muscles and the plexus. The lateral portion of the sternocleidomastoid is being dissected right there. And that lets me visualize things a little better. And then I put my finger in, my index finger in, and I roll back and forth across the surgical site so I see if I can feel the smooth anterior scalene, the ropey brachial plexus, and the smooth middle scalene. And whatever fat the patient has in this area, I mobilize it proximally. This is a thin patient, not much fat to mobilize. Now, there's the anterior scalene. And of course, on the anterior surface of the anterior scalene is the phrenic nerve. And that phrenic nerve is what I'm looking for now. Unlike the other nerves in the neck, it will move from lateral to medial. So it'll have that different direction of transit. And I'll take my micro uh, stimulator here, set on two, and stimulate the phrenic and look for that typical jump on the chest. And there's the phrenic coming into view. I don't like to manipulate the phrenic nerve. I think it is more sensitive than pretty much any nerve I've seen to manipulation. So I'm not going to put a vessel loop around it. I'm going to mark it in blue so I can keep my eye out for it 
as I continue the rest of the dissection, but no vessel loop around the phrenic. Every other nerve here can get a vessel loop. Now I'm picking up that anterior scaling, and I'm going so slowly through the anterior scaling for a few reasons. One, so I don't get bleeding. Two, so I can identify fiber spans within the anterior scaling, which are pretty common. And then also so that if the patient has an extra phrenic nerve within that anterior scaling, I protect it. And also, when I get to the bottom of the anterior scaling, I'm looking at the subclavian artery. So lots of reasons to take your time and slowly go through this. There's a bunch of lymphatics medially. There's my phrenic nerve. And I'm just going to slowly walk my way down. Now there's a retractor on the phrenic nerve, and my assistant knows that they're retracting the phrenic nerve. So it's a fairly gentle retraction. As I'm coming through this uh, scaling, the patient has a very tight band. It's small but very tight, crisscrossing across the brachial plexus. And I'm going to divide that, actually divide it sharply with scissors in a few minutes. But I could feel that as I was coming through on this dissection, the little click click of the fascia on the most lateral free border of that scalene muscle right up against the brachial plexus. Now I have a, a retractor and it's a lighted retractor. You can see that above. It's a good idea to have a lighted retractor because it's pretty much a little bit of a hole in here. That's that band I was talking about. It's really tiny but very fibrotic and compressing the uh, plexus. So as a little breather, I haven't got all of that anterior scaling done yet, but as a little breather, I'm going to go somewhere else, and that is onto the brachial plexus. So I have now the dissection right on the plexus, and I'm going on the medial side of the brachial plexus. And I'm removing all that thickened epineurium around, external epineurium around the plexus. Now there is a branch off the upper trunk on the lateral side, of course, the suprascapular nerve, but there are no branches off the medial side. So once I get the main bulk of the upper plexus, which is right there, all of this stuff or junk can go, but I'm going to go slowly through here as well just to make sure that if there's any little vessels, I have them organized. And then spread it apart to make sure there's nothing exciting in there. There shouldn't be and there isn't. So I'm going to now bipolar that. And then I'm going to walk down that medial side of the plexus to identify the upper and middle trunks. And you can see them coming into view. And I have removed the thickened epineurium around them a little more mobilization of that vein and now I'm going to go to the other side of the brachial plexus and identify the middle scaling. So I have to lift that fat north again or, or uh, superiorly and I'm going to find the middle scaling and look for the long thoracic nerve. So you want to elevate that fat proximally and take your time to get good hemostasis through here. You don't want to get staining of the tissue with a lot of bleeding. It slows you down, but you really don't have such good vision if you get a lot of bleeding in here. So there's the middle scaling. And I'm picking up that middle scaling. And the brachial plexus is right in front of it. So now I'm going to clean off the posterior or lateral border of the brachial plexus to separate the brachial plexus above from the middle scaling below. Now I'm going to take my nerve stimulator again and just stimulate posterior to that middle scaling. That helps me identify the long thoracic nerve. And when I did that, I didn't feel any jumping. So I've stimulated. I don't see any jumping. So I'm going to go cautiously through the middle scaling now, but thinking while I'm doing this, where is my long thoracic? Because I haven't identified my long thoracic and I need to do that. I identify it with that nerve stimulator. 
if I can, but now as I'm going through the middle scaling, the long thoracic can go right through the middle scaling, so I have to be pretty diligent there. And as I'm picking up that middle scaling, I can see that streak of fat, which is the long thoracic right there. Now the long thoracic, you can definitely put a vessel loop around it, and I highly recommend you do that so that you um, tug the nerve around, but you don't cut the nerve, and you don't miss the nerve as you're going right through that middle scaling down to the first rib. C5, 6, and 7 give contributions to the long thoracic, and sometimes as you're moving proximally, you will definitely see the 5, 6, or 6, 7 contribution coming together into the long thoracic. So you want to be prepared for that branching pattern. I have a number of patients who have weakness of the serratus anterior and when we see this long thoracic I've seen veins crisscrossing across it so I'm always wanting to neuralize that long thoracic to look for that to see if there's any special compression on the long thoracic. It can be tethered as it moves through this muscle and just dividing this middle scaling can free up that long thoracic and improve weakness in the middle uh, or the uh, serratus anterior. Now as I'm coming through this middle scaling, there's a lot of fibrous bands in it and you'll see that shortly. I'm right on the first rib now and I want to clear the middle scaling attachment to the first rib over a very long distance. There's the lower trunk of the plexus coming up now. So I'm moving the brachial plexus medially to try to get the interface between the middle scaling and the first rib. If this looks like a slow, tedious dissection, this is a slow and tedious dissection. There's just no room for error in these procedures. Look how close that shiny fascia is to the brachial plexus. It's touching it. And everything's white. So take your time as you come through here. Now I've got the plexus retracted. I know where it is. I've got the lower plexus retracted. And so now I can come through that fascia slowly as it attaches to the first rib. And I can feel the first rib below with my pickup so I'm oriented, I know where I am, but really just a nice slow dissection. Now I'll do this every now and then too to give myself a little bit of a breather. I'll go back and show you some anatomy. There's the cutaneous nerves with the two vessel loops to move them back and forth, and the long thoracic nerve with the single vessel loop, the blue phrenic going lateral to medial, some of the lymphatic tissue medially, those are just lymph nodes, and then the brachial plexus below. So as I'm showing you this, when I haven't actually finished the dissection, I do this anyway because I need to give myself a little bit of breather. And now I'll go back and I'll get the last bit of, well this is the little part of the middle trunk to the pectoral muscles. That's the middle trunk and there's this little fascicular group right on the top of the middle trunk I'm going to stimulate that for you and you can see the pectoral muscles moving. I'm just showing you this because this is a good donor if you need a nerve transfer for accessory or super scap. So you can see that little fascicular little group. It's almost self uh, dissected. I'm not going to dissect it in this case, but it sits right on the top of that middle trunk. And you can, now I'm just stimulating deeper to show the triceps, but right on the top is where you'll see that fascicular group, group to the pec. So that's something to just note. And now back I go again to dissect the last parts of the anterior and the middle scaling. A little more of a neurolysis on the plexus. My head's getting in the way here because it is a deep dissection and I've got my uh, lighted retractor back in here now and back to the scaling attachment on that first rib. It's kind of endless. It just seems to go on and on, but you want to get a complete 
release of the middle scalene attachment to the first rib for a distance of about an inch or so. So more tendinous bands within that middle scalene. And I'm scraping on the right on the first rib right there. Going right down to the first rib and releasing it proximally and distally for an inch or so. Another fiber span hugging right against the lower trunk. I know it's the fiber span. I've got the nerve medially. I've got my retractors in there. I've got that sucker in so there's no smoke from the microbipolar. And I'm trying to get that sticky little fiber span right there. And now that I've got it cleaned off, I can cut that. And that's going from the anterior to the posterior aspect of the first rib. Yes, good. So that's looking a little looser. And just really a slow dissection. You can see the upper, middle, and lower trunks. You retract them, and then you divide everything else. And just go slowly and take your time. And have good help. I've got great uh, retraction in here. I'm taking my time, lifting up the fiber spans, feeling the rib, anterior edge of the rib, and taking all of the soft tissue scaling attachment. And now you can see those plexus is starting to really loosen up there. I do a minimum neurolysis, just take the extra thickened external epineurium away from the nerves, and it'll vary, of course, from patient to patient. And if they've had trauma, there may be more than otherwise, and the lower plexus is coming into view there. So this video is about 25 minutes long or something like that, and the procedure itself takes about an hour. So as slow as this looks, the procedure itself is twice as slow. Now I'm going to come anteriorly and get the rest of that anterior scaling loose. I like to use the uh, peanuts to do a little bit of the dissection and also to help with good visualization. So there's our phrenic nerve intact, long thoracic nerve intact, brachial plexus intact. If I have a neuropraxy, I'm not going to particularly worry about it because I can see everything's intact, but I want to know about it. And so that's my last um, stimulation so I know that everything's intact or not. And there's my cutaneous nerves protected, some marking in the incision, a drain, a pain pump, subcuticular closure, and a loose sling, whatever keeps the patient comfortable.